Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In one of today's Bible readings, we read in the prophet Zechariah, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For lo, I come and I dwell in the midst of you, says the Lord. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. This has been a beautiful week. In this area, it's just been fantastic. It's been sunny. The weather's been very nice, and we have enjoyed the outside in our home. Dido and I have taken several bike rides through the forest preserves, and as we've been riding through, we watch the parents who are jogging with children and strollers and what have you, and sometimes we see parents walking hand in hand with a little child. It's such a beautiful time of year and a beautiful thing to see. And it called to mind a story I heard about a mother who was walking with her four-year-old daughter through the woods, and as they walked, the daughter bent down, and before the mother could realize what was happening, the daughter picked up something from the ground and popped it into her mouth. And the mother immediately insisted that she you know, spit it out, and she put her hand there, and so the daughter spit it out, and she gave her her bottle of water, and she told her daughter to rinse out her mouth, so the daughter rinsed out her mouth. And the whole time the mother was saying, you know, you shouldn't do things like that, it's very dangerous. You don't know what you're picking up from the ground. You could get sick. There's bacteria. There's all kinds of illnesses that you could get. You should never do something like that. And so the daughter said, you know, Mom, you know so much stuff. How is it that you know all this stuff? And the mother said, well, you have to take a test to become a mommy. You have to know all these things. And if you pass the test, then they, they let you become a mommy. Yeah. And so they, they walked on together, kind of in silence, and the daughter was contemplating her mother's words. And finally she said, so... If you don't pass the test, then do you become a daddy? <laughs> the mother said, yes, dear. That's exactly what it is. Then you become a daddy. The story is cute, largely because of the funny ways that children make sense of things. Um, taking time alone to reflect doesn't guarantee that someone's going to come up with the right perspective on their life or a right perspective on reality. The church fathers and the saintly women that have preceded us talk about the importance of reflection, the importance of taking time away from the crowd, but at the same time they acknowledge that this time can be counterproductive if it's not taken in the right way. People can spend time alone thinking destructive thoughts. They can think about how terrible their lives are. They can think about how no one cares about them or how they can never get any better or how to get revenge on someone. I remember the case of Howard Hughes, you know, the millionaire who ended up living his last years in solitude, completely shut off from the world except for one or two people that would bring him things, but he was so scared about germs. He was in solitude that he was paranoid about germs. So he had no joy in his life. Spending time alone is not necessarily productive time, yet at the same time, the church fathers, following the example of our Lord, understand the importance of solitude, taking time away, taking time alone. So today I want to impress on you really three things. The first is the importance of taking time away from others, from the crowd, from the busyness regularly. The second is to do this as Jesus did this. And the third is that when we do this, we receive perspective on our lives, we receive spiritual blessings, and we're better able to be blessings to others, to help others as well. So let's look at how Jesus spent his time away from the crowd. Scripture teaches us that Jesus practiced silence and solitude. And one wonderful example of this is in Matthew chapter 4. We read, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So the Holy Spirit led Jesus away from the crowd. That same Holy Spirit is in us, which we receive in baptism. And just as the Holy Spirit led Jesus away from the crowd, so too God calls to us through his Holy Spirit to take time away from the busyness and from the demands of our lives to spend time with him. So too Jesus spent time fasting. And this is part of our church's holy tradition. It's a tradition which unfortunately has largely fallen by the wayside. But each day in the church, 
is designated as a feasting day or a fasting day, and we're called at times to adjust how we eat in order to spend more time focusing on matters of the spirit. Also, Jesus went into the desert and faced temptations away from the noise of the crowd. We are in a better position to gain perspective on our lives. The father of ancient monasticism is St. Anthony of the desert. And St. Anthony lived in a city and he had a regular life until the Lord called him. And then when the Lord called him, he decided that he wanted to focus on becoming holy. And he was having trouble, he said in his writings and in his sayings, of identifying the devil in the city because things were so confused and they were so busy. But he thought it would be much easier to identify the devil in the desert. So he went out into the desert so he could claim that region for Christ. So he could take what was present in the desert, which they understood at that time to be evil, because it was an arid place, it was a dry place, it was a place without life, and to transform it and themselves into people of holiness and a place of spiritual life. When Jesus was in the desert, he faced his temptations with Scripture. In Matthew chapter 4, the tempter came, the devil came, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike a foot against a stone. So the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. And if you look up the scripture, that's actually what the scripture says. But the devil misused scripture. So the fact that someone has scripture in their heads doesn't mean that they're necessarily using it in a holy way. It's possible to learn scripture and use it in a way that's destructive. Use it in a way that leads oneself or others away from the Lord if it's not used right contextually. So Jesus answered the devil and said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Part of the reason Jesus understood the proper application of scripture was not only that he was God, but that he was the product of an interpretation of scripture that was maintained within the covenant community. And as Christians, we too are supposed to read and come to understand scripture within the confines, within the safe confines and guidance of the covenant community of God, which is the Holy Church. Sometimes people will read scripture on their own and think that they can make sense of things on their own. But on their own, outside of the tradition of the church, they can go far astray. So scripture absolutely needs to be a part of our prayer life, but it needs to be a part of our prayer life with an understanding that we are to read it within the context of the tradition of interpretation and understanding of the Holy Church the understanding of the writing of the church fathers. Last night, uh, flipping through the channels, I saw Rambo on television. You remember the Rambo series? I think there were four Rambo movies. It was the last one that was on television, uh, played by Sylvester Stallone, this tough guy. And he was going into Burma to, to fight the bad guys. And when he went in, he took with him a knife, which of course he had forged himself, and, uh, and his fists. And he had a gun that he used, he had grenades that he used, and he had all these weapons at his disposal. And the idea of going into such a dangerous place without weapons would be suicide for him. So too when we go to pray, when we go into the world as well, we have to have the weapon that the Lord wants us to have, and scripture tells us that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Let's say that together. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. So for us to have what we need to have in order to fight the battles that we're going to face in our lives, we absolutely need to have the word of God as a regular part of our lives. To be like Jesus, we have to discipline ourselves to find times of silence and solitude and to have scripture on our minds. Another example of Jesus going away from the crowds is in Luke chapter 5. Now remember how scripture tells us that when Jesus would go into certain towns, he would heal everyone. So if someone had leprosy, he would heal them. If they were a cripple, they would be healed. If they were blind or deaf, he would heal them. If they had heart disease,
disease or cancer or COPD or what have you, he would heal them. He would heal diseases and infirmities people did not even understand what they were, the way modern science understands. But Jesus understood and he would heal them all. So the people were rushing to bring their sick to Jesus. They were rushing to bring whoever they could to Jesus who required healing and they were listening to his words and they were being touched and they were being transformed. Jesus was popular. He was popular for his word and for his healings. And so we read in Luke chapter 5, however, the report went out around concerning him all the more and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him and of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Having all these needs, having all these demands placed upon him, these people desiring so much from him, which was good things they were desiring, healing for their loved ones, to hear the word of God, still he would take time away to go and to pray. We love to feel wanted. We love to feel a sense of importance or power. or We love that feeling of being indispensable that someone really needs us, and no one else can do what we do. Well, no one else could do the healing that Jesus did, and yet he would go away to pray. Jesus didn't succumb to the temptations of just doing what the crowd wanted. He knew the importance of disciplining himself to being alone with his heavenly Father. The world will tempt you into thinking that taking time away for yourself is selfish, but God wants us. He wants you to take time away with him daily so that we can move away from sin and understand his plan for our lives and understand how he wants us to fulfill his plan for our lives. We live in arguably the noisiest time in history. There are portable sound systems, there's iPods that people have with them or Android devices and sound is always with them. We see kids walking down the street, and even adults walking down the street, taking walks, riding bikes, and they have earphones in their ears, listening to music, listening to different recordings. They get into the car and turn on the radio first thing. Come in the house, turn on the radio, or turn on the television. I'm not watching it, it's just background noise. Have you ever heard that? I'm not watching it, it's just background noise. I like the noise. Okay. Or they're on the phone. It's possible that people can go through their whole day Almost never, or never, having any times of silence at all. But the Lord calls us to silence. Because in that silence we can find Him. In that silence we can find holiness. And we see the importance of silence as compared to the importance of noise in the Bible. Elijah, the prophet, was being uh, chased by the armies of Jezebel after Elijah had persecuted the false prophets of Jezebel. And so he went to Mount Horeb, where he heard the gentle whisper of God's voice. We hear this in 1 Kings 19. And the Lord said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. So Elijah is waiting for the Lord to pass by. Then we read, A great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? It was when Elijah was in that place of silence that he heard the voice of the Lord. So too, we have to come to a place of silence in our lives. That means turning off all the recordings, turning off the noise, stopping the texting, stopping the phone calls, getting off the internet, getting off the television, turning off the iPod, leaving all those things behind. And also taking all the noise that's in our heads, all those thoughts, all those worries, all those the concerns that go on like a tape recorder that just repeats over and over again, and offer them up to the Lord until we have shared all of our heart with the Lord and we can finally come to a place of silence. Offering up our concerns and our worries to the Lord is absolutely essential. One of the reasons for this is so we can get to that place of silence and simply sit in the presence of our Heavenly Father. 
And when we come to that place where we stop talking, where the noise is gone, then we can listen. Then we can listen to the Lord's direction. We can hear him as he touches our hearts and our minds and leads us in this or that direction. We're called to holy silence. St. Gregory of Nadi wrote, Let the protector of light enter, ease the severity of my pains, and lighten the burden of my guilt in the silent chamber where my mind collects itself. That's where the protector of light enters. Mother of Teresa Calcutta put it this way, We need to find God, and he cannot be found in noise or restlessness. God is the friend of silence. See how nature, trees, flowers, grass, all grow in silence. See the stars, the moon, and the sun, how they move in silence. We too need silence to grow and to be able to touch souls. Silence is essential to our spiritual growth. One of the church fathers notes that when Mary stood at the foot of the cross, watching her Savior, her Son, bleeding to death, she stood there in awe and in silence. Because at that point, what is there to say? It's beyond words. And when we understand who God is, we will understand that we connect with him in a place that is beyond words. For he is above all thoughts and all minds and all speech. During this period of assumption, let's take the example of Mary and behold the Lord in silence. Let's take time away from the crowds to fast and to pray. Let's contemplate the one who died on the cross for us. Let's come to him and open our hearts, share our confessions, share our concerns. Let's identify the temptations in our lives and look at our lives in the light of scripture and understand and fulfill God's plan for our lives. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in the word of our Lord, as he spoke through the prophet Isaiah, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord. This week, be silent before your Lord.